Welcome to the Who, What, Why podcast. I'm your host, Jeff Sheckman. It wasn't very long ago that to see a foreign language film, you wound up in the smallest theater in the multiplex or a little art theater somewhere in a college town where you lived in New York or San Francisco or Boston. But like everything else, creative destruction has done its job. Streaming in the long tail of the internet has moved to supplant cable, movie theaters, broadcast television, and even the English language as the talisman of all of our entertainment. Even amidst the bifurcation and division in both the U.S. and the world, filmed entertainment seems to be one of the few things bringing the world together. Suddenly at our fingertips is programming made everywhere. And rather than looking at it as an oddity reserved only for a few cinephiles, it's now working its way into the mainstream of all of our living rooms. Is this just a temporary blip due to COVID and the pandemic? Or has global entertainment undergone a tectonic shift that both reflects and might reshape our culture? We're going to talk about this with my guest, Scott Roxborough. Scott is an international reporter covering film and television and music. He reports on entertainment from Europe for The Hollywood Reporter, Billboard, and German TV, and recently wrote a seminal article for The Hollywood Reporter, dealing with this subject. It is my pleasure to welcome Scott Roxborough here to the Who, What, Why podcast. Scott, thanks so much for joining us. Yeah, of course. Glad to be here. First of all, talk a little bit about the phenomenon that you've written about that we're beginning to see, which is this proliferation of international programming that is suddenly showing up on on people's streaming channels everywhere in the U.S. Yeah, I mean, um, I'm sure a lot of people noticed it maybe even just a year or two ago um, with uh, a lot of Netflix shows and Netflix films, uh, which were non-English language showing up. I think Narcos was probably the one that really got caught people's attention a couple of years ago, a uh, Mexican uh, 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 series. Um, and um, since then, I mean, it hasn't been just a handful of these non-English language films and series showing up. There's just been hundreds, literally hundreds, um, and um, in particularly this last year, the pandemic year, when everyone was in lockdown and um, streaming, you know, just shot through the roof. I think for almost everybody, uh, we've just seen so many of these shows, of these films, um, not in the English language suddenly become really global hits. I mean, you had a show just recently like Lupin, um, a French uh, uh, thriller, crime thriller, um, which was a monster, a monster hit. And and there's been, you know, films and series from everywhere, from Korea, from uh, from Japan, African shows, uh, so many European shows, Latin America and so forth. Um, it's almost unlike anything I've ever seen before. I've been reporting um, out of Europe um, uh, uh, on the film and TV industry uh, um, for far too long, actually. Um, and, and I've never seen anything like this where the shows that I've always been obsessed about and the films that I've always been obsessed about and, and tell everybody to go and see um, are actually available and being, being seen uh, by audiences really, really worldwide. And what is your sense as to the reason this shift has happened so quickly in terms of the acceptance of these films to American and global audiences? Well, I think you've got to give Netflix a huge amount of credit uh, here. Um, they basically uh, uh, paved the way uh, for this, uh, both by uh, buying and, and making a lot of these shows, but also really key, and this I think was a major sort of cultural shift, um, by doing things like dubbing. <laughs> they uh, were the first you know, big service to dub programs into English. Um, it's often, you know, frowned upon in the, you know, art house circles to take a great French movie and then ruin it by, you know, splashing English uh, English dubbing over it and English voice over it. But by dubbing, I think Netflix, well, they they know that they that this was the case because they they did tests and they they saw their audience what their audience was doing. When they started dubbing their shows into English, their non-English language shows into English, they found that audiences everywhere throughout the Midwest would watch these shows um, initially because they didn't know that they weren't supposed to uh, enjoy them. Um, So uh, I remember talking to a producer uh, for Netflix who was responsible for some of their non-English language programming, um, who they uh, did a Brazilian show, uh, 3%, which is a superb uh, science fiction uh, dystopian series. Um, And she remember was talking to a friend of hers uh, from I think Ohio, who said, oh yeah, I love uh, those shows, but I don't watch any of the foreign language ones. I, I, I love the show 3%, I think it's great. And so that's 
Brazilian, that's in Portuguese uh, originally, uh, but she didn't realize that because she'd watched it in an English dub version. Um, and I think it's interesting because it's sort of what's happening now is what used to happen outside the US with a lot of American uh, programming, that people would see it in their own language and they would just immediately connect to whatever the stories were and would see them as their own stories. Uh, um, so uh, they would see an American show, but they would see it in Spanish and think, oh yeah, that's those are the people I associate with, those are the, those are the stories I like. I think that's happening now. Um, and a lot of it has to do with sort of the groundbreaking work that, uh, that Netflix did originally. It's interesting because historically, a lot of these international programs have been adapted, the ones that were particularly successful, adapted for American television or American movies, essentially remade entirely, Homeland perhaps being the penultimate example. Yeah, and of course that's still happening. You still have a lot of uh, um, uh, um, those type of shows. I mean, um, you know, even someone like uh, Bong Joon-ho, the uh, Korean director who won the Oscar last year with uh, Parasite, um, uh, he um, uh, one of his uh, uh, films was adapted as a TV series for uh, 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 for America and was turned into a sort of American version. That still happens uh, a lot. I think that's going to probably still keep happening. Um, but what I find is interesting now is that people are very willing to watch or even maybe prefer to watch watch uh, the originals. Um, and I think it has something to do with, I don't know, with the authenticity that comes from an original story. I mean, um, uh, when Homeland, when they adapted that from the Israeli original, um, they of course had to change a lot to make it very American. They did a very good job, and this is a very sort of stands on its own, it's its own series. But if you go back and look at the original versions of these shows that have been adapted, they have a certain unique character about them um, that comes from the, you know, the, the, the cultural setting, comes from the language itself, comes from the way that people act with one another. And I think maybe people are, I don't know, I, at least I, from myself personally, um, I think that always gives a certain authenticity to it, uh, uh, that you can always go to a big Marvel film or big Disney movie or whatever if you want something that's just hugely spectacular. But if you want something that's very authentic and true to life, um, I think you want to go straight to the source. And um, that means, you know, going watching the original French film or the original Korean uh, movie um, and not waiting for some usually watered down American version of it. What impact has this had on international producers of these films, the fact that suddenly they are finding this huge audience that that couldn't have been anticipated two years ago. It's it's I mean utterly transformational. The um, the impact, particularly on countries that um, weren't used to having their uh, films seen by anything but a tiny audience outside their home countries. Uh, um, Korea is a great example. Uh, Korea, is, uh, of course, is a huge local industry, but in the last number of years, uh, they've been really able to uh, um, reach a global uh, audience. But I'm also uh, actually really interested in areas we, where we're almost where the industry almost didn't even exist. Um, like a lot of countries in Africa, um, now uh, it is possible for an African filmmaker to make a very local language, uh, local story that if it you know finds its way to a streaming platform like Netflix or Amazon or whatever, um, can reach a truly global audience. And that allows them, that gives them access, not only to that audience, but very importantly for them, um, to the to financing uh, for for their next film and their next series and so forth, uh, so that I think you and I see this already. A lot of international filmmakers um, are saying we don't have to make a movie in order to get to Hollywood and go there and make English language films. We can stay home, make the films that we want to make, tell the stories that we want to tell in the way we want to tell them, and still reach a global audience and still have this you know a, a phenomenal career. What impact do you anticipate that this will have on the producers of American product who suddenly don't have the same kind of monopoly that they did a few years ago? That's really interesting. Um, I, I think, I mean, in a way, uh, um, this phenomena, it's not really a, um, a zero-sum game. Um, the the sort of market, the audience is, is really growing because people are consuming just so many more films uh, in total. So I don't think it's a negative at all for uh, American filmmakers. And uh, I mean, uh, before the shutdown, uh, we saw the huge success of the, the huge Marvel films uh, um, globally. Um, so I don't think it's uh, necessarily a negative. I think we're still going to see big American movies that will go everywhere and that will be watched in every country of the world. Um, what I do think it does, though, provide for um, for American uh, filmmakers is an opportunity to uh, tell stories 
um, that might be seen as being, um, used to being seen as being niche and to tell them in whatever they way they want. I mean, uh, you're seeing a lot of interesting American filmmakers now that are doing films maybe set in um, minority language communities within America, uh, um, uh, like Farewell, uh, which is a mainly Chinese language uh, a movie, but very American story. Uh, um, um, and uh, I think that opens up opportunities um, for uh, American filmmakers, particularly for ones from minority communities or uh, to, to, to get stories told in a way that previously would have been rejected because they would say, oh no, we can't sell that internationally because it's, it's not in English. Um, that's not really the case anymore. And so I, I see it more as an opportunity for, for uh, American filmmakers as well. Will this create pressure on international producers to essentially pay more to cast, to directors, etc., because suddenly there's a global audience that wasn't there before? Yeah, that is sort of already happening um, for sort of the very top end of um, uh, of talent, let's say, uh, internationally. Um, so uh, Omar Sy, the uh, French actor who is the star of Lupin, he's also a big uh, film star, particularly in, in Europe. Um, uh, he's in huge demand because of this show um, and, uh, you know, French producers who would want to get him in there, his get him for their next movie or series will have to really pay top dollar. And I've talked to a number of um, producers who, who said specifically that if you want the very top level talent, they become very very expensive because the Netflixes of this world, the the Apples and and so forth, um, are willing to pay a lot more than would typically be the case. Um, but when you go a few levels down from that, uh, um, I don't know if it's that much of a uh, of an issue yet. Um, it could become though, because so because um, Netflix, of course, has started this, and you're seeing HBO Max and Disney and so forth come afterwards, and also make local language productions. Um, as that grows, um, we'll, I think we'll see um, uh, an, an issue with yeah, with just <laughs> the amount of money that local productions can afford to pay uh, local talent, and there could be the case that, particularly for, as I say, the sort of top end talent, that they'll only be making their films and shows for these big global platforms and not for sort of their their their, their local partners, which we would typically typically been the case. Did the fact that we have had successful American movies made by international directors, Korean directors, Mexican directors, Spanish directors that have, have won awards and been very high profile over the past several years, did that in some way set the stage for this? I think I think it did to a degree. Yeah, I think actually um, what I find interesting about uh, the, you know, the the directors that you mentioned uh, from Korea, from Mexico, um, what was interesting about uh, a lot of the films that they made, also their American films, is they they brought to them a different sensibility. Uh, they brought to them an international sensibility uh, that that combines sort of elements of the Hollywood tradition in terms of, you know, big action scenes or a type of pacing and, and so forth, but also um, I would say a uh, sort of art house sensibility that comes from a sort of international um, uh, filmmaking approach. Um, and they were able to combine those in a way that was incredibly interesting, exciting, and new um, also for American audiences. And I think that's why they, um, uh, uh, they were so successful with some of their US productions. Um, and I think that type of filmmaking, which maybe could only have come from outsiders coming into the Hollywood system, um, uh, allowed uh, or prepared the audience, uh, the U.S. audience, um, for a different type of storytelling. This new way of storytelling, this new form of storytelling that came from these international directors coming into the Hollywood system, that prepared the U.S. audience uh, for a different language of cinema. Well, I mean, uh, literally later uh, in non-English language productions. And I've always thought that there is a huge audience for non-English language uh, cinema uh, and storytelling. I watch all these films and they're great movies. And I tell people at home, uh, uh, you'd love this, you'd, you'd love to see it. And I think it was just a barrier that was almost an artificial barrier that was was put up uh, by the sort of the gatekeepers, uh, the the cinemas or, or the, the television channels that were a bit frightened of uh, their audience, really. They didn't think their audience was ready for this. But that fact that uh, we had some of these international filmmakers uh, from Mexico, from, from Korea, who were able to make big US films that were very, very successful, but had a sort of international sensibility, 
prepared uh, the American audience and and um, uh, prepared also those gatekeepers to maybe take more chances and um, and yeah and open up uh, their audience to uh, to sort of the broader world of uh, uh, of storytelling. Um, and so I'm not necessarily surprised that it's happened, but uh, I'm, I would never imagine that it would happen so quickly um, and be so so completely embraced uh, really uh, by the US. Do these international filmmakers create a kind of farm team for these big American companies for to make international films? There's a degree of that. I mean, the big uh, platforms are definitely looking around the world now for for, for new talent. And um, as soon as uh, some filmmaker in uh, an African country, in Europe, in Asia, in Latin America, has a success, uh, uh, Netflix or, or, or now Apple and Amazon will quickly jump on it and they'll want to make more with them and uh, so forth. What I find is interesting now, though, is it's, in some degree, that always happened uh, because uh, if you had a big hit in France, for example, the studios would come uh, running and say, "Oh, do you want to make a U.S. big U.S. film or an adaptation?" Or and they try to put them into the Hollywood system. Um, what's happening now is a lot of these filmmakers can stay home and do the kind of productions that they want to do, just on a much larger budget uh, and for a sort of global audience. What I think is also happening, and I find that all very interesting, is that the platforms are no longer looking just to the U.S. audience uh, first, um, and the studios aren't either. Uh, their biggest markets now are outside the U.S. Uh, Netflix, almost in all of Netflix's growth as a company in terms of subscribers, comes from outside the United States now. So they're as interested in what Indian uh, audiences want to watch as they are in what Texas audiences want to watch. So the an Indian, local Indian uh, filmmaker, even if their uh, films or sh shows mainly appeal to a local Indian audience, that's still very, very interesting uh, uh, for a Netflix or, or an Amazon. Um, and that never used to really be the case for the, the big studios. So what's happening now is both these big US companies are trying to get talent from outside um, and, and get them to make you know, their stuff for a global audience, but they're also very clear, carefully looking at all these international countries and saying, well, can you make stuff for your own audience and we'll pay you to do it? And that never used to happen in, 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 at, this, at this level. Talk about that, the impact that it's going to have on local content as more and more of local producers in, in countries around the world want to have the big hit that's going to be, you know, internationally received through Netflix or Disney or whatever, will it have an adverse effect on local content? Um, at the moment, I don't see uh, that many uh, uh, downsides to to this sort of explosion in international content. Um, it means a lot more money for uh, producers from outside the United States and for for talents and fil talent and filmmakers outside the United States. Um, and I see that as a good thing. Um, there is a bit of distortion that is happening uh, because, uh, particularly in some territories uh, which don't have a large local market or a large industry. Uh, a Netflix or or an Apple TV comes to town and they can distort the market because they can pay several times what uh, would be typical for uh, a local production. Um, but what I find is interesting is that with the that these streamers in particular aren't looking to um, to create some sort of American version of a of a film or series that they just happen to do in shoot in Spanish or 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 in Korean or or Bengali, they are trying to find new niches uh, where they can where the the talents that they discover um, can can produce their best work. So, in a lot of territories, what you're seeing is not that they're replacing the local productions, but that they're complementing them with stuff that either because it would have been too expensive to make or because the local producers, local channels or whatever um, weren't interested in making it um, is, are now, is now getting a chance uh, to, to, be, to be made. I mean, uh, I'm based in Germany and one thing that I've always found uh, odd about this market is that so few genre films, you know, horror, or science fiction, or whatever, were produced in in Germany. The the vast majority of German films are sort of dramas and and and, and comedies and lots of period movies, of course. Uh, 
And since the Netflix of, of the world have come to town, we're seeing a lot more of these sort of genre films or genre series, like a series like Dark, which is a supernatural mystery series, time travel mystery series, um, that uh, um, we're seeing a lot of these type of shows being made. And I know that the local uh, filmmakers, I know a lot of them, I've talked to them, they've always wanted to make these type of uh, shows in their home country with their own stories, but we never got the opportunity to do so um, because of how the system here was set up. And I think all these new players coming, these global players coming into these local markets are providing uh, the local talents with these opportunities. At the moment, I don't see a real negative side to it. I don't see sort of a, because at the moment they're doing it differently than maybe the studios would have a few years back. They're not trying to make everything American. They're going to the local audiences and the local talents and say, what are your local stories that you want to tell? Um, and how can we how can we best uh, support you to to get to do that? We're talking about this in the context of of these big streaming services and 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 ultimately, perhaps, in terms of theaters. What impact do you see this having with respect to broadcast television, both in the u s. and broadcast television as it still exists internationally? Yeah, there's a lot. Um, um, uh, yeah, I think there's going to be a huge uh, change in uh, w- what happens on broadcast TV, what we watch on broadcast TV. Um, but that change has already been happening, actually, for quite some time. From outside the United States, um, um, there's been a trend I've noticed for quite some time now that the sort of big U.S. shows just aren't traveling much anymore. There's there's almost no. Um, uh, big American shows that are really on prime time around the world anymore. They, it doesn't just doesn't exist anymore. Uh, the last was probably uh, Big Bang Theory, uh, which was very successful in many countries around the world. Uh, but that was almost the last uh, uh, of those type of U.S. shows that sort of conquered the world. What you're seeing instead on broadcast TV uh, around the world is much more separation, localization. So the stuff that's very very popular in America is not popular elsewhere, but the stuff that's, a, and the stuff that's very popular in Britain on broadcast TV is not really popular uh, outside of Britain. And each country is sort of doing its own thing. Um, in, in, um, in, in, in a lot of cases, focusing on uh, non, non-fictional storytelling. So game shows or reality TV shows or, or, or so forth, or sports, um, those are still very, very popular, but tend to be very, very local. Um, and I think that's a shift that, that is probably going to continue and, and get stronger. So that when it comes to broadcast TV, we'll probably be watching uh, local shows um, that don't travel. Um, and then when we go to our streaming services, wherever we are, we'll have we'll probably be watching a lot more global shows that, that uh, people are watching around the world. The proliferation of, of all of these shows now and, and people watching all of these shows, to what extent... Is it a function of the pandemic and all the time people have had on their hands? And one wonders to the degree to which this will continue post-pandemic. Yeah, the pandemic has definitely had a huge impact on um, on viewing patterns, on, uh, uh, I mean, just on the time that we have to check out new things, obviously. Uh, I think that has had a huge impact on people finding these non-English language shows and getting into them and talking about them and so forth. Um, but I'm not convinced that it's going to all go away once the pandemic is over, because there's a lot of things driving this, also from a business point of view. Um, the um, big global streaming platforms, they want to expand internationally. Um, they need to uh, expand internationally so for their financial models. And the best way to find subscribers outside the United States is to offer them local programming in their own language. Um, that's what Netflix has shown with, with, with their incredibly successful rollout. Disney has just uh, said they're going to be making a lot of local language programming for their international audience as well. And I think that sort of driver, just the financial business side of it, will mean that this trend won't go away. There's going to be a lot more um, non-English language uh, films and series being made that will be then, you know, presented to an international audience. And I also don't think that the American audience is just going to suddenly say, well, we're tired of watching Spanish or Korean uh, uh, shows. We're going to go back to just watching American stuff. I think the American audience has gotten a taste of what's out there um, and they, they like it. And I think they're going to continue to try and uh, uh, seek it out, um, even 
when they have less time on their hands and are, you know, going out uh, uh, and seeing people and eating in restaurants and going to bars and so forth, hopefully very, very soon. For those that are not as familiar with all these shows, talk a little bit about where they're coming from. Some have come, as, as you mentioned, from Korea, from France. Where, where are the, the key, and of some from Israel, where are the key places these shows that, that are finding an international audience coming from? Yeah, I mean, in some ways they're coming from almost everywhere, but there are a couple of key sort of places uh, that because of their local industries have been very successful in uh, capitalizing on this sort of new global streaming boom. Um, Israel is an interesting one because they have a very strong local market um, and they've been very, very good at um, uh, and making shows that uh, can quickly travel just because of the themes they they approach uh, a lot of sort of you know thriller themes or 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 I mean just the politics of Israel is so compelling <laughs> that it, it perhaps translates very well to a global uh, audience um, um, there's certain the bigger territories in Europe uh, are very interesting Spain in particular but also uh, France and Germany because they have very large local industries so uh, they can quickly sort of ramp up production to um, to another level, and uh, they have a lot of talent here that um, can quite easily uh, adapt to doing you know bigger budget productions. Um, but I find the most interesting ones are Mexico and Korea uh, because those are um, countries that uh, basically had a very strong local industry, but was very focused on their local uh, market and developed, I think, a a, um, a very a specific way of telling stories. There's a sort of, there's a whole generation of, of uh, Mexican uh, filmmakers that, that you know, form almost a, uh, I don't know, almost a club of, uh, 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 of, of creatives that tell stories in a certain way and have developed their own um, type of language around cinema. Um, and now, and that's the same with Korea, definitely. And these filmmakers now have an opportunity to uh, tell the same, to tell the stories they've always wanted to tell in their very specific, unique language, but have it reach an international audience. And so I find those territories some of the most interesting. And I just saw that Netflix uh, is looking to spend something like $500 million on Korean productions this year, a phenomenal amount of money. Um, that will produce a huge amount of new shows and films. But I think because the Korean um, uh, industry and Korean, Korean filmmakers had time to sort of in their own local hothouse, develop their own way of telling stories, their own sort of story uh, filmmaking tradition, that they are in a great position to then take that to the world and not just, you know, copy an American style. Um, uh, I think the countries that, that have their own strong local traditions are the ones that are best positioned right now to be able to, uh, yeah, to be the next big thing. Is it optimistic or naive to think about all of this in, in the sense of, of creating more global understanding, global awareness, greater cross-cultural understanding? Uh, I, I never know to what degree um, uh, film or, or, or TV um, or art in general can, you know, bring the world together or create uh, understanding. Um, but I, I know I'm hopeful. It's, it's great to see that American audiences or international audiences are getting pictures of the world that are not filtered through their own local uh, biases that are that are come directly from the countries uh, and from the storytellers in those places. Uh, I think that's uh, uh, um, could be very important. And it, it is it is, I mean, it, it just on a very basic level, it's it's great to hear uh, languages other than English uh, on uh, uh, on American uh, uh, sh American TV or on American streaming services, and to know that people around the world are are, are watching them. I don't know if it'll bring world peace. Uh, I think that's probably <laughs> too much to ask for uh, for a TV show or for for a film, but but it can't hurt. Have any of these shows, and I, I can't think of any examples, I'm, I'm sure you probably can, delved into political territory that might be controversial or that might be perceived as, as controversial in a particular market? A good example of that would be Fauda, which is a phenomenal uh, Israeli uh, series uh, about a um, uh, an agent uh, who goes undercover, an Israeli agent who goes undercover in a, um, a Palestinian uh, terrorist group, um, of which there are uh, Israeli agents. Uh, and it was 
um, controversial both on, uh, basically on all sides. <laughs> um, some saw it as being uh, too pro-Israeli or too anti-Palestinian. Um, there were plenty of people in Israel and also in, around the world who saw it as being uh, too um, uh, uh, portraying the um, uh, Islamists as, as in, in too positive a light. Um, so, so that caused controversy everywhere uh, it went, um, and also within its own own country. Um, and you do have the number of shows which because of their the way they treat i don't know things like sexuality or or um, uh, um, um certain political issues can be very controversial um, outside the country that they're made and not inside the country uh i i know as well as you know even within the united states uh uh certain issues uh say if we talk about abortion or 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 sexuality uh can be seen as being very controversial within the united states but wouldn't necessarily be so if they were seen here in, in france so it's an issue that you're seeing a lot of now uh particularly with these global platforms which will make a show maybe intentionally for a local audience say in india or or in france or or, or in mexico but then have to deal with sort of the um public outcry in a completely different country. Uh, um, and that's something that basically has never really happened before. Uh, so it's, it's, it'd be interesting to see how a lot of these platforms deal with that type of situation where they say, well, this was meant for this local audience. They understand it. They don't think it's a problem, but this other audience way over here who, who doesn't, don't really, doesn't really have the same context or cultural background um, is incredibly offended. What do we do? I, I think it's, uh, it's an interesting uh, challenge, but I, I, I quite in, enjoy it actually. Sometimes I also enjoy these type of controversies because it then shows, uh, reveals our own sort of framing and our own sort of prejudices. Uh, uh, why do I think this is controversial and this isn't? And and maybe I'm what I think is 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 politically horrible is is actually quite normal in in this country. Uh, and so uh, I think it's a it at least creates discussion, and that's always always good around around any cultural issue. How do you think this will play out as as theatrical comes back as theaters start to reopen again around the world? That's a really good question. I'm, I'm very interested to see what happens as theaters start to reopen and um, and movies start to come back into into cinemas. Uh, if this sort of experience that we've all had of being able to see um, in films and, uh, and series not in English um, and enjoy them at home, if that's going to translate to us wanting to see them in theaters as well. Uh, we saw uh, with uh, Parasite uh, that you can have a non-English language film that does incredibly well uh, around the world um, and very appeals to a, to a big American audience as well. Um, so I don't think that's that's going to go away. But I'm not certain that um, because film the, um, because uh, cinemas are run differently, they are still a certain type of gatekeepers. They're still worried about getting bums on seats that there still could be a hesitancy to not take a, what they would perceive as taking a risk with uh, a, a film from a small country somewhere in a, in a language that uh, um, American audiences aren't used to hearing. Um, I hope that that isn't the case though. I hope that um, cinemas uh, see this as an opportunity and to say, these shows or these films from from, from Mexico or from Africa, from, from Asia, um, maybe they will find an audience because uh, people even in the Midwest, even even in the smallest uh, towns in, in the United States, um, they're watching these, this stuff on Netflix. So maybe they'd be interested in, in paying to go to the theater and, and see it too. Um, I'm hopeful. Uh, I, I've always thought that audiences are a lot smarter than you know uh, most cinemas and most television channels give them credit for. Um, and so I hope that um, that plays out when cinemas reopen. And do the executives at American Studios and particularly at the telecom companies that now own them, do, do they fully understand what's happening here, do you think? Hmm, I think uh, the sort of corporate bosses at uh, the various studios and at the platforms mainly look at numbers. Uh, they don't really uh, uh, care that much about the detailed cultural underpinnings of uh, their productions. Maybe I'm being unfair to them, but I think essentially they're businessmen and they look at the numbers. Um, and the interesting thing when it comes to this issue is the numbers say 
make more local language production, make more specific productions uh, that speak to the local audiences. That's where your growth is coming from. Your growth is going to come from India, from Korea, uh, uh, from, from Africa. It's not necessarily going to come from the United States. So it makes sense to focus on those local audiences and what they want. And the interesting thing is that if you do that, it seems to be the case, if you do it well, that those shows, those films, will also travel and will find uh, an audience back home in the United States. So in some ways, the businessmen running these companies, they don't have to be globalists. They don't have to be uh, uh, that interested in Korean or, or Senegalese culture. Um, they just look at the numbers and say, we need to do this in order to hit our figures. Uh, um, and uh, it's it's having benefits, uh, you know, all down the line. And I guess Disney is right. It's a small world after all. <laughs> yeah, definitely. <laughs> Scott Roxborough, I thank you so much for spending time with us. Really appreciate it. No, thanks so much. Thank you.